last installment of, um, of, um, of Art School um, for this term, which is a collaboration between After All, CSM, and Maspin uh, in Sao Paulo. Um, and so tonight, uh, our speakers are, um, our main speaker, sorry, is uh, Silvia Serafinovich. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, perfect, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so Silvia is a curator at A Political, and she's, she's also a writer um, addressing crucial social and political practices. Um, her curatorial projects uh, include, uh, in 2019, The Second Coming by Kendall Gears, uh, 2018, Wild at Heart, and um, in 2017, Shikaith, This Was His Body, His Body Finally I uh, His, and um, Iwa Axelrad, Shtama, and uh, Labor Relations in 2016. Uh, and she's also um, uh, a member of, uh, of ICA, the Association, um, the International so Association of Art Critics, uh, UK branch. And she's accompanied tonight by Alison Green, uh, who's an art historian, critic, curator, and uh, a senior lecturer at Central St. Martins, um, uh, as well as by um, Vanessa Spiridelis, um, who's a curator and whose research covers Pan-African religions, pirate history, and intersectional feminist uh, history. So um, they're gonna discuss uh, Sylvia's essay on the work of uh, Elizabeth Catlett and entitled Addressing uh, systemic uh, invisibility. So I will leave the floor uh, to all of you and uh, uh, very much looking forward to your conversation. Oh, just um, last remark, uh, the talk is recorded and um, you can ask your questions in either the Q&A uh, box uh, or, in the, or in the chat and uh, I, will, I will share and uh, read the, the, your comments or uh, questions to, uh, to our panelists. Uh, so yeah, thank you and um, see you in a little bit. <laughs> thank you. So Sylvia, are you going to lead out? I was about to ask who's going to start. Yes, so I can. <laughs> so maybe as I promised, I'm going to do a very brief introduction um, to to the work and, and to my essay. Um, so I'll share my screen now. Um, yes, yeah, so now you can see the work that we're going to be um, talking about today, um, Students Aspire by Elizabeth Catlett. This work was um, publicly launched in 1978, and it's a public commission um, by Howard University. Uh, in Washington, DC. Um, and the reason why I decided to talk about this work and, um, and Elizabeth Catlett is because um, she was, uh, she had a very um, important experience as a student and she was also a student at Howard then um, in, in the 1930s. Then in 1978, she returned um, to do this commission. But she also had a very rich um, life as a teacher and a professor of sculpture uh, later on. Um, and that experience of teaching and her experience as a student, I felt like really manifested itself in this work, as well as um, the issue of um, that she was like the issues that she was fighting for, like her whole career and her whole life, which was the invisibility of labor. Um, and aspirations of, of the Black community uh, in the United States. Um, so um, I titled my essay Addressing Systematic uh, Systemic Invisibility because um, I feel like a lot of what she was fighting for in the 1970s and throughout her life uh, we still um, have to address. And um, I'm, I'm saying in my essays that, uh, essay that uh, the students that we can see on um, on this slide uh, in this work um, who aspire for equality, uh, you can see the sign of equality um, that they're holding in their hands, uh, is still a dream that hasn't been um, uh, that hasn't materialized. So um, 
so when I was invited to write this essay, one of the aspects that we were um, supposed to discuss that we, I hope that we're going to discuss today was how we link um, a, a material culture and a, a physical space of uh, a university of a teaching environment with the digital one um, that we are working in and meeting in at the moment. Um, so I thought I'm just going to show where this work is situated. Um, it's one of the main alleyways of the university and, and you can uh, walk um, like past this, this uh, sculpture quite easily. Um, Vanessa has an experience of actually seeing it in, in flesh, like I could only do a virtual tour. So, um, so I'm, I'm very happy that Vanessa can, can join us today and speak um as well more about it and and ask questions um so i don't know if there's anything um anything that you think i should say at the very beginning i i think that's that's uh, a little bit um of an introduction well thank you so much sylvia um and i'm so pleased to be talking to you about this so i mean i think the first question is uh you sort of already indicated a little bit of this but why did you why did you pick this work to write about and uh, how did you come upon, come upon Elizabeth Catlett's work? Mm -hmm. So um, I explained a little bit of my, my motivation um, behind picking up this work. I, I feel like um, when we're talking about teaching environment, like um, the, this issue of equality or lack of it is, is really crucial and, um, and, and it opens up a, a conversation, um, a very important conversation about representation and um, and and also um, like uh, possibilities and and the power that comes from a supportive environment. And Howard um, was an example, is an example of such supportive environment for for the Black uh, communities uh, in the US. And um, and we can like if we go on the website of Howard University, we can see like how many like amazing um, alumni they have uh, in the, in their ranks. And um, and I think that to bring this positive example of of what a supportive environment can can do um, for a student, um, and Catlett was one of those examples as well. Like it's really important because um, because. Like in general, I, I can see that um, that we have a we have it, it's still a big issue to create such supportive environment for all the students um, in um, you know in, in Britain. This is where I'm where I'm based, where I, I can make this kind of observations, for instance. So so that was one one of the reasons why um, I came across um, Catlett's work for the first time um, at, uh, quite recently at an exhibition, uh, Soul of a Nation, um, that I've seen at uh, Tate Modern. Uh, here in London, and this was the work that was presented, um, Black Unity um, from 1968, this is the other side of it, and it was just such a, such a strong object, and I was immediately like drawn to it, and I wanted to understand more and, and also like learn more about this artist, and um, and when I started reading about Catlett, I discovered that she really um, like the, the work that she was doing was reflective of her own values and her own experiences. And, and she was an incredible example of, um, like I said, a teacher, but also an activist and an artist that um, um, had this incredible integrity. And, um, and, and I could like, she did so much in her lifetime that it's enough material to write like several essays and like each of them like would pick on, on a different, very important subject. So, so that's, that's, that's why I, um, I used this opportunity to, um, to, to write about her work that I was really fascinated by for a while. So maybe it's a good time to bring Vanessa in. And I, I, I think there's a lot to talk about. Um, I mean, maybe the audience won't know uh, about Howard University, you know, what it is as an institution. And I suppose there's, you know, there's a context here about, you know, African American experience, black experience in America, that Catlett's life um, really uh, traduces in many interesting ways. Vanessa, do you do you want to um, ask Sylvia a question or or elaborate? Oh yes, hi, hello everyone. Um, um, yes. 
So actually, Sylvia, I do have a question and mm -hmm. um, I do would like to elaborate. I have been to Howard University and it's very interesting because Howard University has multiple different, uh, multiple public artworks on the university. So for Catlett, it's actually one of the only two female artists mm -hmm. that work is featured on the university. And the other is Lois Mayu Jones. And she has a very beautiful um, stained glass window that's dedicated to the founders of the university. So this is the only actual art piece that was designed as like an art piece. Mm -hmm. for the university by a woman and I think it's really interesting because when you walk by it you, you're taken like suddenly you're stricken by this image on the building it's not something that you like is advertised but it's something that's very striking in the environment and also reflective of the community I, I believe especially since there is a lot of public discourse about uh, like just politically and socially surrounding like the university as well as the community. So um, actually, so my question is related to the actually is to related to your essay on page two, and it's a small, it's a bit of a quote. I love quotes, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's going to be a little bit of a two-parter. So in the beginning, it's a quote from actually the founder of Howard University, Oliver O. Howard, and it's, um, we must destroy slavery root and branch. This is a hard duty, a terrible, solemn duty, but it, it, it is a duty. And then about a, par a paragraph or two later, you mention, you say, um, the emblems form a triangle and following Catlett's own interpretation of the work we're discussing mm -hmm. now the visible work. And following Catlett's own interpretation are meant to represent the upper branches of a tree. The bodies of the students form the trunk and stands on foundation representing the roots. The roots are sprouting from 12 masks and each representing one black scientist. And I think it's really beautiful in terms of the original intention from the, like, from the founder's mm -hmm. own words about what he wanted from the school to now this, mm -hmm this artwork by Catlett on the, like on the school being praised. And I just wonder in terms of like, like what do you think the transformative message for, like, um, for material culture to translate through time, like to translate through time? Is there like, how would you, like, or yeah, I guess not how, but what are your ideas on that in terms of how material culture can just be, that like, can be used as a, machine to generate connectivity through pockets of time, in a way. Um, thank you so much for this question. I, I think that um, uh, in terms of, of time, like the, the fact that the title of this, uh, the, of this work is Students Aspire, so they aspire to a better future. And, and I feel like it's our responsibility to look at this work and assess whether we met those dreams whether we you know we, we we made them happen and and from my point of view we we didn't and um and that's why it's such an important work to um remind um you know of like and all that even like introduce the audiences that don't know about this work um because we just um need to continue the work that um uh, howard and then catlett um uh, you know, um, we're doing during their lifetimes, and and I feel like this responsibility of of, of equality and um, and really creating um, what those students and what Catholic was aspiring to is right right now on our shoulders, and um, that's why I'm so happy that we can discuss this in uh, in the context of uh, a teaching environment, um, because. Um, like even um, you know how things like start popping up on your newsfeed when when you're researching subjects and like yesterday I saw uh, an article um, like published a couple of days ago by the Atlantic about um, about uh, responsibility that is on the shoulders of teachers and how um, we can really start um, changing the society or we can produce like we can create an alternative um reality for the students um as teachers and uh, uh, 
when that that would not replicate the you know the the relationships of um, of power and like abuse and and those negative patterns that are outside of the university. So, so I think in that sense, um, and that applies not only to the physical uh, reality of a, a teaching environment, but also to the digital one that I, I know quite often like repl replicates um those negative patterns from 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 the real life so um so this is how i i, I feel about it and like i said like the, the fact that um uh, like the first title that i thought of like um for my essay was uh, students continue to aspire like to point to the fact that this this mission has not been completed um basically yeah, that's great. And you do mention that. And I think it's so you, you really touch on something remarkable there that it is the like the teachers like kind of responsibility mm -hmm. about how we just about how we approach our students and how they effectually go out and mm -hmm. interact with those around them. And I think that it, it like you, you really hit something right on the head there. It's really great. Great point. Mm -hmm. I, I also feel like, you know, because I, I have opportunities to to be in the classroom with the students, um, but they're like, um, you know, now and then, like I'm, I'm not at the university um, teaching like um, every week. So, um, so to bring that to, you know, to, to the reality that, um, that I actually work with um, um, on, a, on a regular basis, which is curating, um, I feel like this is um, a different situation because the relationship that you can have with the audience is um, more spontaneous. Yeah. But at the same time, it's the same kind of responsibility to 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 create an environment that is in, inviting and that um, that encourages people to come and, and encourages people to um, you know to find themselves in the work and also to be part of the of the conversation um, and and part of like you know making this reality different. Um, so yes, yeah, so I just wanted to add that um, I'm not point, only like pointing a finger at, at teachers, but I'm also you know thinking about that in my own practice. <laughs> I'd love to ask, ask Sylvia to talk more about Catlett, Elizabeth Catlett, and who she was. And I'm, I'm, when I was preparing for this and reading about, she had an absolutely extraordinary life. And especially um, it pertained to this question of um, sort of art and politics and um, how, how much a person lives their politics and sort of the consequences of their, of their politics. So could you, could you elaborate more about that? Maybe that helps us build some context around, around this work. And I guess I would love to point out that she was, um, she, was she like 70 when she made this work? Uh, Something? She was born in 1915, so she was 60. Okay, so, so in, in her 60s. So this is, this is you know, this is in the, la the, the later years of her life. She lived, she lived quite a long time. Yeah. But anyway, um, would you talk more about that? I think, uh, yeah. Um, yes, of course. Like, again, like there's so many things um, that I could say. So I'll try to be quite um, brief, maybe, and just um, say that what is really fascinating about her life and her career is that um so she was born in 1915 and, and died in 2012 and she could see so much changing and at the same time not changing you know like if you if you think about the history of the civil rights in in the, in the us you, you can see that um certain like leg legislations are advancing civil rights and then others that are passed a year later I, us to, to uh, two like steps back you know so so for instance like the moment the like um civil war ended the segregation was introduced like this is one of the examples or and only like in 1954 um if i'm not mistaken like the segregation in uh, schools was um outlawed so um so when this work and then like in the 60s like um you know another um Another important rights that would um, that would like at least in in theory like provide equal rights to like to property um, would 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 be passed, but then you know um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were killed also in the sixties, in the sixty five and sixty eight, and so so Catlett when she was um, doing this work like she had to be like really 
um, like she she was like really aware that uh, things are like there are things to be proud of and there are achievements to um, to celebrate. And I think this is like to go back to the work. Um, this is also represented by those roots that um, you know that the students are um, you know growing from. Um, but there. As well, like so many things that we still need to fight for, and um, and she and um, I quote quite a lot this this article that she wrote herself, the, the role of the black artist that um, she published in 1975, so just three years before um, before this um, this work was unveiled. And um, in that article, she's um, she's asking very important questions like what. Who should I? Um, well, basically, how do we um, work as artists in a world that is still not ours, or where we still don't have equal rights? And how how do we reach out to to people? Like, what kind of media do we use um, to reach out to them? And she was she was great at finding the medium that um, that would actually be um, uh, you know that could be like observed and, and interacted with more organically. Um, so not necessarily, so, so by reducing this distance between herself as an artist and the people who she would like to see the work, like she, she made an active effort to make sure that happens. Um, well, um, I think that also like, it's important to mention that uh, her dedication to equality and, and, um, and, and rights, but also to making labor um, visible, like was coming from the fact that um, she was teaching, um, for instance, in 1940s in Harlem, in, in a school where um, for, for, for people who work during the day and they would come um, uh, to learn in the evenings. And, and she could see the hardship, but she would also see like huge dedication to, um, to, to gaining knowledge and to um, like advancing your chances in, in life. And, um, and then for instance, like in 1940s where she was teaching at uh, um, Deloitte University, um, she would um, uh, find a way to show her students an exhibition by Picasso that was located in a park, in a public park um, that had, um, that denied access to, to black Americans. And she would rent this bus in order to drive, um, to drive her students through this park to this exhibition to, um, to share this work that she found amazing. So, um, so these are just like some of the facts from, from, her, from her life that I, I think, um, he can he can kind of like sense through this work and, and kind of transpire through this work as well. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Vanessa. Do you have a question? Um, I do actually. Um, now, in terms of the like the public sphere. Now, um, and another quote that Catlett had asked, actually said that you wrote, I'm going to shorten it down a bit mm -hmm. on, which would be page three. And she says, because art needs to be public to reach the majority of Blacks, regardless of class, the artists are taking art to the streets in mural painting, to churches and to other meeting places. We must go where Black people are. Our struggle is not for Black culture, but for Black liberation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is rooted in the public art aspect. And um, I also find it really, like, was really fascinated in your essay when you were talking about how one of the, like, one of her earliest inspirations for public art was she was actually looking at murals that were Mexican murals that had been painted and documented by the U.S. Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, like, I'm wondering what your opinions or your thoughts are on this about the public, I don't like, I guess, demonization I get of like, of illegal art, such as like graffiti or street art versus the institutional, like institutional approval of other art. And what's your opinion on that? Mm. It's, yes, it's interesting to, um, to, to see that, that cat that was fighting on both fronts because um, um, you can see, like, if you follow, like, the history of Catalyst exhibition, you can see how, how her work was described. Um, and, like, especially in 1940s um, and 50s, like, using 
racist language um, that was then a norm. Um, a, a very sad norm, and then, um, and then, uh, you know, using the the, uh, the, the adjective um, black, which was, um, you know, with with the capital letter, and which was, uh, which was, um, you know, uh, an, an adjective um, chosen by her as well, and and, and an empowering one. So, um, so that just offers like a glimpse of how complicated and 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 painful like being you know um being a black artist in america uh must have been and um and also like fighting well fighting for recognition like within the um the spaces of of museums and galleries uh, was but at the same time like she was doing that but at the same time like she was one of those artists um that was very present in the public space and i actually um found a reference um, to another uh, work, uh, not by her, but like from the same, around the same time from 1972, which was a mural and um, by Dana C. Chandler Jr. And it's called Knowledge is Power, Stay in School. And, um, and I was thinking that this kind of messaging um, was also very much linked with, uh, with, with Black Panther's movement and with this idea that we need to like start transforming the reality from, from our like closest environment and from, from what is surrounding us. And um, because I'm guessing like, because the distance between um, this everyday reality and this, um, you know, artificial space of uh, an art gallery was so big and so different than um that um you know that artists like felt like they need to make this connection first in order for, for for people to feel more comfortable and to follow and um in the context of like today um and what we're facing today like i i had this like um well kind of like interlinked realization um a couple of weeks ago when um during you know pandemic and, and lockdown, that it's really um, it, there's no point to do exhibitions uh, in in a gallery because um, and that like streets um, in a way were taken away from us and and by by obviously like lockdown was something necessary but at the same time you can see how it's being used by different governments to, um, you know, to pursue different interests. And, and the fact that people can go outside and protest um, is definitely, was definitely seen as an opportunity. Um, so so I, I felt this urge to, you know, to, 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 to go, I, I know it sounds a bit funny, but to go on the streets and to like claim them back um, and to manifest, you know, um, manifest my own thoughts, but but also like in solidarity with the protests that were taking place. Um, so so this is like where I am right now, like in 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 the current context of, of of the pandemic, I feel like and and I can see how many artists are like making the same kind of decision and actually decide to um to um to act publicly and and to make a statement that way rather than um, do an exhibition. Um, Sylvia, it's it's. I really like to turn to this to this topic of of. In a sense, we have um, there's a lot of energy around uh, the uh, how art represents itself in public, who's who's um, who it's representing, and how, and so on. So um, there's a couple of things ways we could take this. We could take it towards um, the present day, and I know you've brought a slide. Um, that represents something that you've been working on, or we could also take it to the past. Um, mm -hmm. So we've we've mentioned <clears throat> you've mentioned already um, a kind of relationship between um, this particular work by Catlett and the and the um, kind of um, public forms of public forms of work like um, the Mexican mural movement or. Um, you know, the kind of cited community-based uh, projects um, cited in sort of various parts of the public sphere. And Catlett herself was really invested in sort of, um, you know, posters as a, as, a, as a form of very accessible, very mm -hmm. kind of um, 
uh, easily, you know, made and a sort of art that carries a strong message. Um, but anyway, we, we have a kind of very heightened awareness of um, sculptures in public space right now, or statues and monuments in public space. So I'd love to, to open up that, that bit of conversation. Um, yeah, so um, about, um, about that, <laughs> this, is such a, this is such a huge, um, such a huge one. I think um, one of the things that, that this, this work got me thinking about and um, was that um, I honestly like, can't think about one um, sculpture within a, a British university that I would seen that would represent a black um, scholar or thinker, and um, and and knowing like how many um, people like should have this kind of recognition, um, like you know to realize that there's there's um, there's none that I've seen. Like again, like I'm talking only about my experience. Was um, yeah, it was a really sad and 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 scary realization. And and I was thinking that before um, before. Um, the statue of, of Colson was um, taken down, but I, I, when I saw it, I wasn't surprised because um, because of this thought that I had. But also, um, like historically, whenever there is a revolution happening, like statues you know, are going to fall. And and when 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 Colson statue was was taken down, I was. Um, I was really excited because, because I could see the revolution happening in front of my own eyes. Like I, I didn't think I'm going to necessarily witness that in my lifetime, which, um, yeah. So, so that's, that's my thought um, on, on this, but I am very curious also to hear what, uh, what you and Vanessa think about it. I, I would like us to have more of a conversation maybe on, on this topic. Vanessa, do you want to come in? And I, th I think you maybe uh, okay. you sort of indicated a, a something earlier with talking about um, a kind of um, much more radical kind of um, you know illicit interventions into public space, for example. Oh yes, um, yes. Uh, I believe the term I used before was disturb, not disrupt. Mm -hmm. That was the term that I had, um, I had introduced to a discussion we had earlier. And the term, like, I was talking in regards to the silence um, project by mm -hmm. Democracia. And it is it's pretty, really amazing. And it is, um, it's very, it, it's striking. And I just find it so, like, telling for the times, especially in a state of growing um, authoritarianism around the world, when you literally there are youth groups and protests erupting everywhere and there's not isolated to one specific country or hemisphere or region. And I think that it's so telling that oh, it's just, it's just brilliant, honestly. I mean, it's inspired by a work from the 1950s of, the, of a nun that was silencing visitors in a hospital. And this image has just transposed, transposed over the decades since then to now. And it's, it's interesting because I think it's such a great response to the illegalization of public art that isn't necessarily, that isn't authorized. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an antithesis to the permanence of it. So it's disrupting the environment, but it's not disturbing anything where you can actually be charged with technically a crime. And you see this pop, like this kind of projection artwork. Um, this is projected on, building this was projected in Houston and London and now is at Warsaw and and I'm in New York City I I'm not the most well connected person on social media I don't have a million followers but I do like to think that I have an active presence and I did not know this was happening in Houston now of course that has to do with my, my own access like what I'm exposed to but this is a remarkable project for it not to have made its way on like hashtags. So it also goes to show you who is controlling these digital spheres, even like 
even still now that like even when we have protest movements that are being organized mm -hmm. online is it's like who does have the authorization at the end of the day because we are still the like the outspoken voice i just i i thought it was great <laughs> yeah um i'm sure I, I will think of other things to add to this <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah I think it's um, with, with this project, um, I'll, I'll pass the message to the artists um, because they should, uh, you know, um, take all the credit for it. But um, but it is like um, on purpose shown in different contexts to um, to basically amplify and to show that um, that this this issue of um, authoritarianism and and how it grows and develops is is a global one right now. Uh, but at the same time, like, um, you know, we are all want to be very respectful of the local context and, and local issues and, and work in dialogue with them. Um, because, um, uh, because the context of, um, of installing a work like that um, every time is different. And, and also um, there are different challenges that are quite surprising. Like, for instance, um, because this work in Warsaw was installed on commercial screens, LED screens, um, uh, at one of the, uh, well, at the major hub, um, underground hub in, in Warsaw. But because it's commercial and not public, there's no public scrutiny, uh, scrutiny uh, around it. So it was possible to install it and it wasn't taken down. And that was very surprising to me uh, personally, because I thought that this is where we're gonna run into trouble with this work and in contrast to that like it was the experience from london where um, we couldn't get the you know the banners enjoy the collapse um on like despite like you know reserving them in advance despite like having like free um, free free like steps of approval and then at the end of that process someone would say no actually it's too controversial and that was also in a commercial context so um so that made me very aware how um commercial like in in you know in london like means um um censored as well and and um and that is something that i i want to think about more um and um democracy on on purpose work with um with the media that are usually uh used by uh commercial um uh, enterprises or by the government to explore this kind of tensions um so um yeah so so in terms of um and they're not using they're not putting a hashtag on this work um so in a way because um like you've seen uh, vanessa like um uh, apart from from this installation of physical space we we also launched this image as an open source so everyone can download and, and share it and use it as a form of digital protest and those realities are like, you know, parallel realities because we wouldn't put a hashtag on this work because it's it's in a way, um, yeah, it, it's it's like a st step too far perhaps for the artist, but it's something again that we all were like talking about and thinking about. Hmm. Sylvia, there's a question from somebody in the audience just to identify. I think we launched into um, talking about this work without saying clearly enough who it was by okay. um, and sort of, and when did this happen and what was, just give us a little context for, for, for um, you know, why this work was installed in Warsaw. Um, so this work was installed um, only a couple of weeks ago in the run up in, uh, before the second round of the presidential elections um, in Warsaw to, uh, so at the heat of the political debate and, and when, um, when the whole discussion about um, already like existing authoritarian moves and backtracking of civil rights like had no presence in the public media or even in the private media because um the, this uh, um those elections were just consuming it all like consuming the whole space so so in that very noisy environment like we decided to put up this image that would remind of of those um issues and also that would be like a sign of of like um, a call to pause and think about what might happen if you know um in the aftermath of the elections um and it's um it's always like important for the artists like for democracy so the work sorry just to go back to the basics is called silencio or silence and it was also translated into polish as chisha 
um, and it's by a Spanish collective, um, Democracia. Uh, Democracia is uh, our artists and anarchists, so it's always important for them to um, to to like position themselves as independent and not like vote for any political uh, party, but to bring um, the discussion back to the essentials and and um, and, and back to what um, what kind of dangers we we face in today. Um, before we, um, before installing this work in uh, in Warsaw, we also projected the same image on the Houses of Parliament um, a day before, uh, on the day where um, I think it was the 13th of June, when um, when um, Black Lives Matter protesters um, were protesting in town. But at the same time, um, the, the defenders of the um, of the public monuments, the right wing defenders of the public monuments, were also present, and those two protests um, clashed at one point. Um, and it also was a day before um, an anniversary of, of Grenfell fire. So, so there was so much that um, that I, from from my personal perspective, and and also the artists like that, um, that the government is not talking about, is not addressing, and is kind of like um, you know waiting for the storm to pass instead of um, actually acting upon some very valid. Um, um arguments and somebody valid very valid um you know problems and um uh, like one of the examples was that um i think a couple of days before we did this um uh Domin cummings was asked um if um about diversity within the cabinet um and if they have any um black members of the cabinet and and to that he responded that it's about diversity of 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 minds and um, and that was like an example like a very good example of how you know how how the government acts and how this conversation um, is is being played out like by by not engaging and by like silencing um, the, those voices and, and protests so that's a little bit more of a context to it mm -hmm. fantastic I want to um go to the questions and just encourage people yeah. also to come to ask more of them. Um, so somebody named Valerina asked, did you mention which museum this is displayed? Valerina, maybe you could ask that question. Do you mean the Democracia piece? Um, I think maybe that's what you were talking about. That's uh, installed in, in the underground station in yeah. Poland, in, War in Warsaw. There's another question from an anonymous attendee um, referring to the catlet, um, commenting that the equal symbol, uh, maybe we could go back to the catlet for a minute and look yeah. at it again. Yeah, you know, so they are pointing out that the equal symbol feels really poignant, especially in regards to education in the, in, in the States, in the US's separate but equal doctrine. Um, they cite mm -hmm. confirmed in 1896, but overturned in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I'd love to, I'd love to look at that. I mean, I think there's something really interesting about, you know, thinking about the specificity of this, of any, um, you know, the material and I can, I kind of graphical specificity about any, any work of art. And the, there's obviously something super interesting about that double valence of the equal symbol. Um, and, and it's what, what meanings it could, it could kind of generate. Um. Yes, I think it's um, like this fight for um, fight for equality and for for equal rights was always very much linked with um, with with fight for education, for access to edu education, and for access to knowledge. And um, some of the most important um, alliances between. Um, between um, uh, white uh, suffragists and, and white abolitionists and, and, and um, black fighters for social justice were also formed in that context. Um, and, and like, I, I always like um, appreciate that, um, for instance, Angela Davis um, in her work, um, in her book, uh, Woman, Race and Class, is mentioning those um, examples where um, whereby um, opposing the law um, that would um, ban um, from, um, from from forming schools for for black children um, they actually really you know helped um, change the social reality and they were ahead of the time in terms of legislation so 
So I, I, I feel like there's a, a very important, um, like just looking at the history of education, uh, we can learn so much about the history of, um, of, of fight for civil rights um, um, movement. And, um, and again, like this, this fact that, um, that that's been mentioned in the question um, that it was equal but separate, like shows how difficult that fight um, was and why and, and how this like system in a way is working by um, by allowing something and then taking back and by um, by making um, by making it more difficult in a way to understand um, racism and to um, to to see it on on a on, on a surface level like without actually thinking and and i think this is the um, uh this is something that um that is also very um very present in um in in britain as well that um in a way you need to activate your empathy and also critical thinking and um and have conversations and um, in order to understand the scale of it, if you don't have your own like lived experience of it, so um, so I, I think this is this is something that is that is crucial to understand um, like where we are right now in in this fight for for equality. Yeah, um, I just would like to add. I think I I never even paid attention to that association, to be honest, I, that eluded me. But I find it also very interesting is that in speaking of separate but equal, she was actually, this Howard was the school that she went to, but she was originally supposed to go to um, Carnegie for yeah. our, and like in sculpture, and she was denied because she was black. So I think it's really interesting about that, the equal sign, especially given it's not just about the equality between the like ethnicities. It's also about equality between genders as well. And Sylvia, you you wrote really poignantly in your essay. I think you um, mentioned it twice. This you used a phrase like the the relative autonomy of of universities, or maybe sort of education in relationship to. Um, you know, a, a, a separation or a critical distance between it and um, let's say sort of commercial life or uh, uh, hardcore capitalism or, you know, or, you know, um, state, state politics and so on. Um, so uh, I, I think maybe it, it would be interesting to hear you talk about that because in a sense, this is, this, this thing that we're trying to tease out in the context of these conversations does have to do with, um, you know, what maybe what what education can can do that's particular. Um, we've already talked a bit about that, and maybe what 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 artworks can do, like almost like what what educational function they 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 have or can continue to have. But I would like to hear you talk about this um yeah it's like the double edge of um what education uh can can offer but also the kind of that 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 in many regards where it's it's also quite compromised hmm. um i mean from from my um observations um i feel like we need more integration of um of work like Catlett and of um, of of the thinkers of the civil rights movement, like thinkers and um, and and people who followed into like the the mainstream. Um, so um, so everyone can learn about them and um, and they become a part of our knowledge about the world um, instead of. Um, instead of like treating them separately um, as you know as as black culture studies, for instance, and um, and I think that's um, like again going back to um, going back to the to the situation of um, you know of of working in the arts sector or in the or culture sector, um, you can see 
like even looking at the map of, of topography, like cultural topography of London, you can see that separation is still very present because there is a separate institution called Black Culture Archives. And it's great that it exists, but I had to go to that institution to learn certain things that I would never hear about at my university. And that shouldn't be the case. I think, or like I would learn about a, a book that was in the process of, of making and then read an article in The Guardian about another writer um, working on the same subject and, and she would get this kind of exposure, but the author I, you know, I learned about at the Black Culture, Culture Archives wouldn't. So, so, so there are like this kind of issues of, um, you know, lack of, uh, lack of integration of this knowledge into the mainstream and lack of exposure and, um, and, and I, you know, I, I would follow um, the discussion about uh, curriculum and what kind of um, history in even like, you know, even on the level of um, what was it, um, life in the UK test, right, where that I, I had, um, you know, I had a um, great pleasure to pass sometimes. A couple of I times. had to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, what, what I like, told you nothing about the UK, nothing about the history, nothing about the past. So if you go on, on the, you know, on, on the website of the, you know, uh, maritime museum in Greenwich there's nothing about colonialism you know it's all about discoveries and exploring the seas like without any connection to what it actually meant so yeah so there are like layers and layers and layers that um yeah that that, that we could like discuss within this context so I think we're coming up to the end of our hour but there is a comment um from Alex Shady in the in the audience um and he's pointing out the fact that the work takes on the form of a tree mm -hmm. um and he says perhaps the tree of knowledge in, in this reading equality becomes the highest form of knowledge question mark mm. um yes yes it was uh, deliberate um from from couplets to um to um to show those students as a trunk of a tree that has those roots you know in the past in in the achievements of the previous generation and then its branches um reach out to the future and reach out uh, to this equality that you know that that we hope um is achievable and Sylvia, I've, I feel like because you brought it, it would be really nice just to scroll through your slides to come to the sculpture oh. that you made a reference to in your um, this, in your essay. But yeah. we, it's really nice to see the image of it. Um, and I was particularly struck because this, um, you know, and it, you know, your your particular association between um, the way Catlett's work, you know works what it's kind of uh what is the messages it, it constructs and mm -hmm. the relationship between um uh yeah socialist realism in in europe yeah um I mean, is, mm -hmm. go ahead this is more um well this is more of a feeling that is based on, on some facts from her life like the fact that she would study um with um under Osip um, Zatkin, who knew uh, Vera Mukina, who, whose work we can see right now on the slide. This is um, this work um, is titled um, Worker and a Co-Host Woman. And it was done uh, in 1937 for um, an international exhibition in, in Paris. And I, I've learned that this work was actually situated opposite the German pavilion um, and as, as a form of a standoff between the two. It was just before the Second World War, um, but this this um, this work like symbolized equality between um, working class and peasantry, um, and it was interesting to because it, it became um, like a symbol and also like a pop culture almost um, almost image um, that then was um, used by one of the uh, main um, uh, film production companies in uh, in Russia. And um, and I was wondering if she um, was exposed to this image through Zatkin, who knew Mukina, they, they met in Paris, but also through her husband um, in 1940s, Charles White, who used socialist uh, realism quite a lot in his um, work to represent um, labor of, uh, of Black Americans. And that, um, that connection of um, 
that connection is very interesting for me because um, it shows that um, there were there was like global like there were global fronts um before you know globalization or before what what we think you know is globalization and um and and that another connection that i'm aware of is is for instance um trotsky writing about um about of like fighting again like in in his um writing about the rights of the of, of black american workers so um so this kind of alliances that were formed in the past um, is something that I would like to explore more because they're showing that um, they were possible and and that they um, you know we can learn from them right now. And is this um, would I be correct in saying that this is also 1937? Mm -hmm. The Paris Expo was where mm -hmm. Picasso's Guernica was 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 yeah. also shown. I think so. Um, so really interesting. Um, so should I just do a time check? Should we uh, be thinking yeah, we, about wrapping up, Adina? Yeah, we, we've reached the hour, but since we started a bit late, I mean, if there are more uh, comments or questions, I think we can take one or two more and, uh, and wrap up in like five, 10 minutes. Okay. Else, I, I mean, we can conclude, but um, I'm sure you have more thoughts. We don't have any more questions that I can see, but I, we'd love to hear some more if people want to uh, type them in. Um, Vanessa, maybe you'd like to come back in and just yeah. take a chance to say to say some more. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, let's see. There's so much that has been discussed. <laughs> it, it's very exciting. Uh, let's, uh, I kind of, let's see, can we go back to the cross-cultural artistic um, a, like conversation we were just having a, a couple minutes ago in terms of um, the overlap, like the overlapping bet of, between Catlett's work and what originally inspired her and how that could be used for future class, like for future in like academic spheres. I think that, especially since we're talking about integrating, um, integrating in the pedagogy to make sure that there is a more diverse field in classrooms. I think that's the intention. So I'm just curious, like, how could we use this in the future or like any like ideas that you have off the top of your head? Um, how can we, well, I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm following a conversation about um, uh, about this, and th there are so many things that um, divide us, but there are at the same time so many things that you know can connect us, like so many experiences that we have that can connect us. And um, and I'm I'm actually um, working right now on on something that would be dedicated to um, to dialogue. Um, that would allow, like remind in a way, for instance, of, of the fact that there was a moment in the British history where Britain was proud to be a multicultural um, country, you know, and that, that is somehow completely like forgotten um, right now in the public discourse because it's so divisive again. Um, so, so I think like reminding about those like traditions and and um, and thinkers like Stuart Hall, for instance, whose um, concept of um, diaspora um, and you know a society growing together and 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 learning together from each other's experiences um, is one of an important like of of important point of references for me. Um, and if we you know, if we could, um, I mean, I'm, I'm being very idealistic right now and hopeful, but if we can look back and, and see what worked in the past and, and remind ourselves of those practices and, and, you know, and just like work together as a front, you know, international fronts to, to populate the, you know, the, the public um, sphere and the, and the digital sphere with this kind of references, I, I think we can really make a change and make an impact. And, um, yeah, so so that's that's my hope. I would say. Uh, we have a last question um, from Alex uh, Shady. Um, it would be good to know more about how the work was commissioned. I think that's uh, yeah, the important piece of information. Mm -hmm. So there was a public um, commission. There was a public um, uh, call. Uh, for this work, uh, but I know that uh, Howard also invited, I think, initially like nine artists to submit their 
proposals. And then um, a, a committee that was formed uh, from students and also um, the faculty selected the work that they wanted to have on this building. And um, Catlett also spent quite a, a lot of time with the students um, to understand how they would like to be portrayed and how they would like to be represented. So um, from what I could um, find about this commission, it seems like very much in a dialogue and in response to, um, to what the university and what the students wanted to see um, on, on this facade. And it was um, designed as being reflective of the core values of the university, which is, I think, very important. Um, so so in, in a way, it's like a very proud moment for, you know, for university and for Catlet and for, for the students who, um, who could see themselves um, reflected in this work. Yeah, I would really recommend to people who don't know the university, you could just go visit their website. It's quite, it's quite, um, inspiring to think about a university that's been around for 150 years, um, founded to educate um, African Americans. And, and it's like, uh, it's, it's really quite visionary. And as Sylvia was saying, I think um, there's a kind of ethos that's really clear in, in how the university represents itself. Um, and they have an art department and they have an engineering department and they have, you know, you can study law there and uh, they've had, an, you know, the graduates of, of that university have, have, have had a, you know, a, a really strong impact on, um, on, uh, on American culture. Uh, so yeah, it's a very, it's a unique, it's a unique thing. I don't think there is a, um, a university in the UK that's uh, based on ethnicity or race, is there? And I think for, well, within the, the, the frame of, uh, of after all art school, I think that was an, an amazing choice. Uh, I think it's the only um, um, uh, piece of uh, public art that, um, that's been written about uh, so far because there will be uh, new essays uh, in, uh, next term. Um, and also, um, uh, I think it, it really allowed to, to speak about, you know, well, both the, the work and the historical context, but also uh, very urgent contemporary, uh, contemporary issues um, and also, uh, what, I mean, because one of the of the of the, um, the question that traverses the the, the, um, the art school project is the question of uh, of access, a uh, certain form of you know presentness and, and intimacy. And I think, like uh, through your your amazing uh, discussion, uh, Vanessa, Sylvia, and, and Alison, I think um, I mean you you've really really addressed the 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 the, uh, the force and, um, and and value of uh, of um, of public work, works of art. So. Um, yeah, uh, maybe that's that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, a way to 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 conclude. Um, so yeah, really, thank you for 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 for, for joining us today, and uh, and Sylvia for for for, for your piece. Um, so this is the yeah, this was the last uh, session for for um, for this term, but we'll be back uh, in September, October. Uh, with new essays and um, and new uh, and new conversations uh, such as uh, such as this one, um, and um, well, meanwhile, uh, hope everyone has uh, has uh, has a beautiful and safe summer, and uh, hope everyone everyone joins uh, joins us again um, uh, next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That was amazing. Yes, thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. <laughs> I don't know if Amber is stopping the recording. <laughs> <laughs>